All right, dear friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, AOM specialized conference here in Tel Aviv on behalf of the organizing committee. Uh, for those of you who've been here um, for the, or who are here for the first time, it should have dawned upon you by now that the reason for organizing a startup to scale up conference uh, in this location is extremely fitting, Tel Aviv and Israel in particular. Uh, some claim that Israel is the number one startup nation in the world because it has the highest startups per capita and there's other impressive statistics to support that claim. Um, Many people have thought about why that might be the case. I have a very simple explanation. I attribute it to a word called chutzpah. Probably most of you are familiar with it. It's uh, supreme self-confidence or nerve or gal. I like to uh, translate that freely into, I can do this so much better. Um, these cranes that you see here, they shape the skyline of Tel Aviv. Um, and they're very symbolic to the rapid development of the city and of the startup mentality and of the many technologies that this country has uh, brought forth. One of them being USB flash drive, which only in Israel is called disk on key for some reason. We have also uh, brought forth the Tomachio. Nobody can go without it. This is also the country of the world's first cloud connected tablet. <laughs> Dating back to 1500 BC. Uh, not many know this, but this is also the country that invented the two-player game, guess who? This is a special edition, uh, the Dovev Lavi special edition. We received a staggering 359 submissions to this conference. Just want to point out that 37 of those were highly irrelevant. <laughs> uh, we did a small survey to understand where those odd submissions came from. Um, it turned out that 36 had submitted to an AOM specialized conference on acute otitis media, which was also known as middle ear infection. <laughs> and then one person from Alaska was just looking for a warmer place to stay during the winter, literally wrote us, I'm so cold. We had 188 accepted papers, which uh, are spread out over 69 sessions, and we have many other events that you find in the program. Um, Again, another small survey of those 351 uh, attendees that are uh, partly here tonight. Um, I did a quick survey. 62% of you said, uh, this is based on a representative random sample, of course, moderately to very happy to miss the flight back, especially missing the holidays with the in-laws, which to me is a stature of the young success of this conference uh, already. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, everyone who is here, who has contributed to this conference. Of course, all of you have submitted wonderful papers. Um, special thanks to our keynote speakers, Professors Kathleen Eisenhardt, Rashri Argawal, and uh, Michael Tushman. I also want to extend a special thanks to our track chairs, Kostas, Dovev, Nora, Chet, Ronnie, and Grazia. Uh, of course, all of the reviewers that were involved, the discussants, the advisory board members, the journal editors of all the journal sessions that we have, all the distinguished guests of the panels that we've seen and that we will hear about today, um, the PDW organizers, of course. Um, I also want to point out the doctoral consortium organizers, Niron, Hila, and Ronit, for organizing two wonderful uh, doctoral consortium. All the panelists, I'm not going to name you by name, you're listed here for making that a success as well. Um, we're very indebted to um, Ravid Cohen Metal and uh, Adi Bin Noon for putting together the wonderful panels that we have, that we saw today and that we will see uh, this evening as well. And a special thank you also to the AOM staff, um, which we had a, a very wonderful interaction with over the past uh, year. Many of you involved, thank you very much for a very nice collaboration. Um, couldn't go this evening without thanking the local production uh, people especially Sharon klein Raz and her team, and of course our sponsors, the Color School of Management, the Eli Hurwitz Institute for Strategic Management and the Technion, and the Asper Center for Entrepreneurship at Hebrew University, and our sponsors, Startup Nation Central. 
I'm very scared to go off stage and forget anyone. If that is the case, you'll be acknowledged in my next publication, which might take a while because conferences are time intensive. I think that was most of it. Um, I did forget two individuals, of course, Ella Meyer Inspector and uh, Ulrich Stettner, Stettner, who behind the scenes have worked uh, very intensively. Ulrich, of course, being the person here in Tel Aviv taking all the heat and doing all the hard labor and LME from across the world um, trying to contribute what we could. Um, just to close off, I hope you have a very fulfilling uh, and enjoyable conference also that you get to be inspired by what we have to offer here, but mostly also by what Tel Aviv has to offer and what Israel has to offer, uh, the vibrance and the many contrasts that we have, the fast and the slow, uh, the mix of um, cultures, the fantastic gastronomy and the culture and the art scene that we have, have to uh, offer here. I'm very much looking forward to enjoying that all with you together in the coming days. Um, that was it from our side, and I'd like to welcome the Moshe Tzviran from the Kolar School of Management. Hi, good evening. I survived no chance after Shiko, but uh, I don't have funny slides and I don't have funny information. Uh, first of all, I'm happy to see all of you here, which is, by the way, a lie because I see nothing from here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the only thing I see is pretty much like feeling in a classroom. The first four rows are populated only by people who have to be there. <laughs> uh, I'll try to keep it short because you have definitely many more interesting speakers. So first of all, I'm really happy to have this conference. It's a great honor and I did say so to the organizers. Uh, Israel is known for years, even before the book was authored, as a startup nation and Shiko mentioned that per capita, per capita is misleading. But per capita, we are number one in startups. Uh, try to say to Chinese. Okay, I'm meeting the delegations uh, about every week, telling them we are number one, and they're looking at me. And then I quote the number about 30 to 40,000 startups, which they have in a major city. So, uh, but that's life. Uh, but, you know, for many years we have tried to look at the problem why don't we have, it was years ago, why don't we have the Israeli version of Nokia? We don't ask it anymore. But uh, we have not managed to grow large corporations like Nokia. Uh, many of the startups uh, look for the exit, or if they don't look for the exit, the exit looks for them. And the best, uh, probably the best model will be Mobileye last year. Uh, it's just a matter of price. And probably companies, and Shiko showed you the discount key, probably companies, uh, once they have uh, gone through the first innovation, feel much more safe to do it globally from another location. And when I try to, to, try to lecture to uh, delegations from abroad, uh, I typically tell them that uh, if you want to go by bus, car, or train from Israel, it's only if you're willing to uh, uh, take a one-way trip because there's no chance you're going to come back. So in, in order to make it uh, a global uh, production, in most cases it will be outside of the boundaries say, of Israel. And yes, I know about Checkpoint and Amdocs and other names I can drop. But generally speaking, we have not yet seen a major uh, Nokia or a major Nokia similar company uh, here. So you have a lot to talk from startup to scale up, and our derivative is startup to scale up uh, in Israel. So hopefully, we'll take some lessons uh, from the, this meeting, uh, maybe to uh, the Israeli companies. Uh, and I know I'm the third one. Actually, I thought I was going to be, go first, but I'm the third one to reiterate. The many thanks uh, to the, first of all, to the organizing committee. I have not seen Chico and Ella around here, but I've seen Uriel uh, on a daily basis. And he's now sitting here comfortably. I don't know whether you're so comfortable. But I know that the, the holy trio, the three, uh, have worked a lot to make this conference a successful event. So thank you, Ella, Chico, and Uriel. And uh, well, these are the fruits of your work. That's uh, number one. I want to thank the uh, sponsors. I want to specifically thank the two other institutions, Hebrew U and Technion, for being our partners. I want to thank everybody who came here. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in many more events here in Israel. You know, this is a rare occasion. We have two conferences on the same day in our uh, school. But I want to see you more here. And you're more than welcome to be our guest. And meanwhile, enjoy the conference. And thank you all.
Okay. Um, wow, you can't really see anything. He was right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I actually want to thank the organizing committee for something completely different, and that is for giving me the best job in this conference and the most honorable um, job. Um, actually, two jobs. The first one um, is the best paper award, and to announce the uh, winners. Uh, before this, I want to thank the award committee, and that's uh, Peter Bamberger and Shiko Ben Menachem and Gilad Chen and Iron Hashai and Ela um, Spector and Brian Silverman and Uriel Stetner. So thank you very much for all your hard work. And uh, with all, without um, further ado, I think the big check for the million dollars were supposed to give it was supposed to be given by the dean, but I just saw him disappearing with the. So we'll just give some plaques here. But um, in any case, the uh, prize goes to, and if I can call you to stage, please, um, to Michael Roch and uh, Henry Sauerman. And uh, for their paper, Who Joins a Startup? Uh, preferences, Ability, and uh, Structural Constraints as Predictors of Startup Employment. Very, very nice job. And um, it's even a greater um, honor, a much, much greater honor, um, to be um, up here to um, introduce our keynote speaker for um, this evening. I know that, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, Kathy Eisenhart, I really don't, does, I don't need to, uh, to introduce her. Everyone knows, uh, knows her and knows her work. Um, just to mention a couple of things here, though, Kathy Eisenhart is the uh, Stanford Etterman MD Professor and Co-Director of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program. Um, she has authored a couple of books. Um, she's the Distinguished Visiting Professor with INSEAD's Entrepreneurship and Family um, in um, enterprise um, area, I had to say that. We're very proud of it. Um, Professor Eisenhart um, authored over 100 papers in all of our leading journals. Um, she has been um, noted as the most cited research author in strategy and organization studies over the past 25 years. Um, she is a fellow of the Academy of Management. And if I had the time, uh, which I don't, to read the list of uh, awards and prizes that she has won, uh, you, we would have spent the uh, holidays here together. Um, so I won't do this. But there is one thing that doesn't appear on Kathy's um, CV um, and bio on the website, and I must mention it. And that is, um, for many years, I've been involved in recruiting in several universities and had the recruiting again this year. And one thing that amazed me and continues to amaze me, I don't think there's been a year, Kathy, in which we didn't have one of your students um, come to give a talk or offered um, a job, um, extended a job. And I can't think of anything more fulfilling, and I hope you are as proud as you should be uh, for producing those so many amazing um, scholars. If there is one thing that I know that I'm sorry um, that I, I should have done better is to uh, fight better to be, to be one of your students in the past. So thank you very much for joining us here today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kathy Eisenhardt. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the organizers for including me in the, uh, in the list of people as keynotes. Um, and thanks all of you to spending your evening, at least part of your evening, with me. Um, I'm going to try and kick off the conference on Startup to Scale Up uh, by talking about strategy in entrepreneurial settings, so getting right on it. Um, and let's see if I can now figure out my clicker. There we go. Okay. Um, well, I want to start with the idea of, just got ahead of me now. There we go. I want to start out by talking about it. It's actually a San Francisco story. 
And this is um, two guys who I'm sure you've heard of, Brian Chesky and Joe Gebbia, in late 2007 decided they needed a little bit of extra cash and rented out space in their apartment floor space with an air mattress and um, give them, gave people a bagel in the morning to three strangers who started, who were happy to come and share the space with, with Brian and, and Joe. And what that became the start of, as I'm sure you all know, is Airbnb. But the story of Airbnb, while it starts in the end of 2007, there's actually not really a strategy and there's no real Airbnb until almost two and a half years later. And so the point that I want to make to get started is that opportunity is not a strategy. That lots of people, lots of places see opportunities, but only some people actually figure out what the strategy is. There we go. Strategy is, I'm going to define that, the strategy is a set of interdependent activities to create and capture value. Or to keep it simple, strategy is about how uh, executives, entrepreneurs try to win. I'm also going to be focusing tonight on entrepreneurial settings. Entrepreneurial settings being the context of firms competing in nascent or growth markets or with innovation driven strategies. So fundamentally what I'm talking about is mostly about ventures but also about big companies who want to maybe play the, the innovation game. And I want to argue that the dilemma facing people who are trying to be uh, form strategies in an entrepreneurial setting is, is really a, a fundamental one. On the one hand, uh, a strategy has to be novel, it has to be different, it has to be advantageous, but you're operating in an uncertain environment. And so because you have to be working in an uncertain environment, strategy is a lot about doing, a lot about action, a lot about trying to figure out, trying to learn what that market is about. On the other hand, the other part of the problem is you also have to develop a coherent strategy, something that works together, for example, production, logistics, whatever, working together, which is largely a problem of thinking. And so the problem I want to really sort of highlight to, to get us started is the idea that, that on the one hand you have to be thinking, on the other hand you have to be doing in entrepreneurial settings. So what I'm going to be talking about is what is the origin of superior strategy and how does that then therefore translate in from startup to scale up. And I'm going to make a couple of assumptions. We're assuming an entrepreneurial setting. We're assuming that the name of the game is growth, not necessarily profitability, as uh, I think you know if you look at Amazon, uh, but it's about growth. It's about opportunity logic, not about positioning, not about uh, RBV. It's about trying to capture opportunities sooner, faster, and better than rivals. So that's sort of the overarching set of ideas. In particular, there are going to be the two ideas about thinking and doing. To use a sports metaphor, what strategy is like in new markets and in and entrepreneurial settings is about playing a sport like basketball or soccer, a fluid sport. And part of the thinking in playing a fluid sport is being, if you think of yourself as a midfielder in soccer or football, or if you think of yourself as a point guard in basketball, it's the ability to see a bigger strategic playing field. And so the first set of ideas I want to talk about is how, how is it that the entrepreneurs, at least that I've studied over the years, the ones who are more successful typically are seeing a, a broader view of the strategic playing field. Let me make that, bring that down to a little, down from hyperspace. Um, first example, and I'm going to use a bunch of examples from, from some research I've done with some of my colleagues. This particular study I'm going to talk about is with Rory McDonald. And Rory and I studied uh, what was called social investing. And this was an, a, a setting where the entrepreneurs who were involved in it were trying to put together sort of a Facebook idea with investment, stock investment. So social investing sounds pro-social, but it was really about making money in the stock market, um, but using Facebook. And the, and the ultimate goal was to try and have amateur investors connect with each other and bypass, for example, Morgan Stanley and the high fees and help each other and all become successful. We looked at about five companies that started in this market in about 2008 and tried to understand why some were succeeding and some were not. We tracked them over time before we actually knew who was going to be the winner or winners and, started, and came up with a couple of ideas. And one of the ideas was that the, the more successful entrepreneurs were not simply thinking about rivalry, but they were also thinking about complementary suppliers, so on. So they had a much bigger view of what they were paying attention to as opposed to just who their rivals were. And in particular what they saw, what we saw that the more successful entrepreneurs were doing was they were engaging in something that we called parallel play. Now if you have a four-year-old, you probably know what parallel play is. It's how little kids learn about the world in kind of a pre-social stage. 
And while there are a number of facets to parallel play that I won't, I won't talk about tonight, one of the primary ones is the way in which you play with your peers if you're a four-year-old. You typically don't play with the other child. You may watch what he or she is doing. You may actually take their toys. Um, you may imitate them. But you don't really either compete or collaborate with them. You're just sort of independently playing. And that's what we saw the better entrepreneurs doing, is they were independently playing, sometimes stealing ideas from their rivals, sometimes ignoring their rivals, but mostly just sort of not caring about them pretty much at all. Another metaphor that one of the entrepreneurs told us was the idea that um, he used the golf metaphor and said, you know, what we're doing is we play the course, not the players. In other words, we're trying to learn about the course, and we don't care who we're playing with. But who they were paying attention to, if they're not paying attention to their rivals, is they're paying attention to their substitutes. And so the idea, I think, we saw with the more successful entrepreneurs, that they were trying to differentiate from their substitutes. In the case of these companies, it was the Morgan Stanleys, the Goldman Sachses, who were also offering investment advice. So it was about, in some sense, ignoring your rivals and focusing on your substitutes. The second set of ideas that I've seen over the years, and this is a couple of different authors I've, I've, I've seen this with, is that these authors, is that the better entrepreneurs typically will try to not take the playing field as given, but in fact try to shape the playing field. So in a study that, that I did with uh, Philippe Santos um, a few years ago, what we did is we looked at what we called the internet stars. We looked at five companies that started around 1996-97. And they were also, they all ended up extremely, doing extremely well. But we tried to understand what they were, what they were doing. And while it had a certain amount of selection on the dependent variable to it, because we were trying to track in time, every one of those companies made enough mistakes that we started to be able to differentiate. And what we saw was one of their characteristics of these, of these entrepreneurs was, that, was the way they tried to create their own industry structure. For example, they would, they would particularly form alliances with mature companies. So they would try to think about what, what rival established company is likely to come in on top of us, and therefore let's make an alliance with them, often giving away revenue, often giving up equity, but to keep those established players out of the market. On the other hand, for some of their entrepreneurial rivals, if someone did get competitive, what they would often do is try to, try to acquire those firms. More broadly, what we saw, in, 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 again, in a series of studies, was what we saw these entrepreneurs trying to do was try to shape the industry structure, particularly around, around rivalry. The third idea about thinking that I want to talk about is the idea of playing the correct game. And over time, what I've started realizing is that the different kinds of businesses are different kinds of games, in the sense that two-sided two marketplaces are not really, doesn't really have the same set of moves as, for example, an ecosystem doesn't have the same set of moves as a software business, which is largely a winner-take-all business, versus a product business, um, which is much more about um, fixed and variable costs. And one of the things that I've, I've noticed over the years, and in, in this study that I'm about to say a few things about, is that the entrepreneurs who are more successful understand the underlying economics of whatever game it is they're playing. So in this particular study that, I, that I've got up here, this U.S. Residential Sol Solar, this is a study with, with Doug Hanna. And we were looking at the solar, the solar system, the, the residential solar business in the U.S. And this business is an ecosystem of about five parts. Financing, solar panels, sales and design, installation, and there may be another one there, but there are about five components. And what we realized, first of all, what's interesting about this industry is there are actually several different strategies that are successful in this particular game. One of them is the well-known component strategy, where you try to focus on, on, on continuing to improve a particular component and then putting together complementers. The other strategy is system, where you try to do everything yourself. And then one of the strategies that we were not expecting to find was the one we called the bottleneck strategy, which involved uh, progressively um, moving from bottleneck to bottleneck uh, over time. On the other hand, what we also saw, what were the firms that were doing that were not doing well, is they were not following. They were, they were trying to follow a component strategy but forgot about the complementers, or they were trying to follow a system strategy but they didn't have the whole system. And so they were straddling between component and system. And so the point of this, this particular slide, which is the Stanford football team, as you may know, um, is the idea of playing the correct game, knowing whether or not you're playing soccer or basketball or football or whatever game it is, or if it's two-sided marketplaces or ecosystems or so on. The key point is the idea of understanding about playing the right game. 
Final idea I want to talk about is this idea of, of locating bottlenecks. And I'm going to say a little more about bottlenecks. But the idea, the particular study that I've got up here is, is one that we're just finishing up now. It's a comparison of DJI, which is the, um, the Chinese drone manufacturer that's become probably China's first uh, global innovation leader company. Most, most of the others are primarily copying other companies, but DJI is actually the innovator. Versus 3DR, which is using a completely different form, much more of a community form. We attract these two firms over time. And DJI is, is, is the huge winner. And one of the differentiators of DJI was around the ability to see the bottlenecks earlier than 3DR. Not always, it was not always the case, but very often it was the case. First of all, in building the flight controller, then figuring out what the killer app was, and then later on putting together what was known as the RTF, the ready to fly drone. But the point is that, the, that DJI was much quicker in seeing where the bottlenecks were, and as I'll talk about in a little bit, a few minutes, um, uh, resolving those as well. So what's the point? The point is this idea that, that, that a successful entrepreneurship is about thinking, about seeing the playing field bigger, shaping the playing field for you, knowing what game you're actually playing, and seeing the bottlenecks that are keeping you from the score, if you want to keep the sports metaphor going. Now you might wonder what's that got to do with traditional strategy? I think there are a couple things that are different. First of all, it's, if we think about positioning, there's a sense of here, of what I've been trying to convey, is that entrepreneurs are not worrying all that much about differentiating from rivals. They're rather, in fact, they'll copy if it's convenient or, or not. And so from a positioning point of view, you're not positioning against rivals, you're positioning against substitutes. From the point of view of resource-based view, you're using alliances and acquisitions, for example, not necessarily to gain resources, although you might, but you're also using them to shape the playing field. So instead of doing an acquisition simply to gain the resources, you're also doing an acquisition to take someone off the playing field. Category creation, I didn't say too much about this, but there's a, in the more organizational theory world, there's a lot of interest in category creation. But I think from the point of view of the successful entrepreneur, it's not so much about category creation, it's about becoming the category king. And the ways in which be one creates a category versus the ways one creates, becomes the king or the queen, um, is different. And finally, it's not up here, but I'll just make a comment about, about game theory. Um, we also think of game theory as being a, 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 po a point of view on strategy. And I think the, the point that I want to make about game theory is this idea, which I think has been forgotten, but game theory ultimately is about a game. And understanding the game is, I think, a particularly subtle set of, uh, set of ideas around, around entrepreneurship. A number, of the, when a number of the companies both I've worked with as well as we've seen in studies who don't do so well are entrepreneurs who fundamentally didn't understand the economics of their business and, um, and paid the price. So that's the first set of ideas. It's about thinking. Second set of ideas is about doing. To go back to the metaphor of the sports and the fluid sports and sports like basketball and football, well, sort of, I'll say soccer, but I guess all around the world it's football, so I should be coming back to that. Uh, basketball, hockey, all those fluid sports. It's not only about thinking about it, but it's also actually doing. And so a big part of entrepreneurship is about doing. And doing at the edge of chaos, and I, hopefully that will become a little bit clearer what I mean by that. But first of all, one of the things that we've known, well, maybe I'll just say the list here and then go on into it. But we've, what we've seen over time is the doing is about the repertoire of experimentation processes, problem-solving approaches, and having a thin playbook. So if you think about a sport like basketball, the playbook is, in fact, relatively small. Let me come up with a couple of ideas then. First of all, on experimentation processes. Something I've been doing probably more recently, some of which is, in, is published, some of which isn't. Um, but the idea that, that entrepreneurs who are able to build and scale their businesses, develop strategies, are, are, are using experimentation. Obviously, everybody, pretty much everybody's using trial and error. That's sort of kind of a given that everybody's trying to learn with trial and error. But I think the more sophisticated entrepreneurs are experimenting. And not only are they experimenting, but they're experimenting in multiple ways. An example is a study that I did with Pinar Ozcan a while back on, on mobile gaming. 
we were looking at the probably five or six firms that were the first of the entrepreneurial firms to enter the mobile gaming industry. Um, and it's kind of a standard methodological approach I think you're probably figuring out in, in my work, at least in this set of work, is we will take a set of companies on the order of two to six or seven, track them from birth they, and, we, and control for their starting conditions and then see what happens. In this particular study we did that and we were looking at the companies that introduced mobile gaming, as in gaming on your phone. And while that may seem pretty obvious now, it was not so obvious at the time exactly how that industry architecture would shape out and exactly what gaming on your phone would look like. And what we saw in the study is that the firm that was particularly successful and the managers who, of that firm, the entrepreneurs of that firm, what their, their secret sauce at the end where they really sprinted ahead was an experimentation because there were, two, there were two big uncertainties. One of them was around the platform, which was, which was Qualcomm versus Sun. But the other even bigger uh, uncertainty was around the genre. What games would people actually play on their phone? Would they play action games? Would they play casual games? Would they play whatever kind of games? And by the way, who was, going to be, who was it that was going to play those games? And so what the particular company that we, that we focused on at the end did was they, they actually experimented. They ran a series of parallel experiments to figure out what genre was going to catch on. And they were the first ones to figure out the answer was actually casual gaming. In contrast, oh, and also the other interesting thing they also found out was that there are many more women playing, ca playing mobile phone games than uh, there are women playing Xbox types games. Uh, and it's also an older demographic. So it's a more female, more an older demographic than the Xboxers. But the point is what this company did was put out some parallel experiments trying to figure out the genre. And because in many nascent markets, the information is so bad that you can't, and there's sort of no, there's sort of no industry statistics, getting your own experimental information is in fact very useful. And what this company did was in fact time it with the, the, the holiday season that's coming up, the December holiday season, and, and knew the right games to have on the platform and sort of spread it ahead. So that was a, a sort of example of using parallel experimentation. They essentially experimented on different genres at the same time. In the social investing study that I was talking about with, with Rory McDonald, um, there's some different kinds of experimentation. Several of the experiments were around serially experimenting, so experimenting, experimenting to learn about certain things, so one after another. But the other interesting experiment was what we called passive experimentation. And that was developing a, a, a prototype, in this case it was a two-sided market, and, and then letting it run, and not really doing anything, not completing it, pausing. And we often think, I think, in entrepreneurship about going faster and so on. This was actually a, this was actually a strategy of slowing down, stopping, and watching and waiting to see what would happen on the platform, who would come and who would not. In contrast, the primary rivals of the, this company that I'm focusing on actually locked, doubled down on, 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 the, uh, on the activity system for the, for, the, um, for the social investing platform and ended up having to, and basically ended up focusing on, on Facebook, focusing on a particular kind of investor and made them, then tailored their, their activity system to that investor. It turned out that locking down early was a mistake because they actually missed what was the better market, which was, was, which was matching amateur investors to geographically isolated professional investors. So it was actually, they actually missed the, what, what the best market was. And, and I think it also brings to the point of, you know, I think there's a lot of talk about pivoting. Pivoting in some sense is an, is an admission that you made a mistake. Um, and in this case, the one firm had to pivot because they had locked down so hard on the wrong choice that they had to pivot. By contrast, the other firm stopped, waited, watched and saw what happened, and moved on. So that's an idea about, about a couple of different kinds of experimentation. Another thing we've been seeing these days is, is that the, the strategy in new markets is not just about experimentation, but it's also the way that you approach problem solving. And sometimes you can approach problem solving in a modular way. You can modularize a problem. And sometimes the problem is, is, is tractable from the point of view of, of integrating. You can do an integrative solution. But sometimes the problem is also novel and complex, in which case you have to actually use a different kind of a problem strat solving strategy, one that combines both being integrative as well as being modular. 
And we saw this first in, in looking at the strategies of, of entrepreneurs who looked at two-sided markets, or were trying to build strategies in two-sided markets. And what we observed was that instead of trying to put the whole market together at once, so supply, demand, geography, platform, for example, you actually, the more successful entrepreneurs would step through one market at a time, one, one component of the, of the activity system at a time, focusing on supply, then demand, then typically platform, and then geography. At the same time while they were focusing on one, which essentially they were modularizing, they were also doing minor improvements on all the things they weren't focusing on. So they were engaging in a very, I think, a very innovative strategy that, that my co-author Tim Ott and I called decision weaving, which was a, a way of problem solving that was both modular but also integrative. Saw it again in the study of DJR and 3DR in, in the drone industry, where DJI in particular used it as a product development strategy, focusing on a single product, but at the, a, a single component, at the same time doing multiple things at once. The final idea I wanted to talk about was the idea of simple rules, which is kind of a, a, a final thought about what people are doing in, in the doing side. And what we observed over time is that, is that entrepreneurs are more successful. They're doing, they're experimenting, they're problem solving effectively. And what they're often doing is focusing on resolving a bottleneck and resolving that bottleneck with simple rules. And I started, well, I've started thinking about this for a while, but certainly the study that, that I'm, I'm going to mention briefly is, is a study with Chris Bingham, where we looked at, at internationalizing, where that was the bottleneck these entrepreneurs were facing, in Finland, in Singapore, and in the US. And we looked at each of these, well, I think it was 12 companies, and we tried to understand why some of them were able to expand and scale and some weren't. And what we observed was that all entrepreneurs learn something when they go to different countries. But some entrepreneurs learn a generalizable lesson and some entrepreneurs just learn about the country. So for example, a, a company was internationalizing and they went to Germany and they learned that Germans drink a lot of beer. But turns out that's actually not a hugely generalizable or insightful lesson. By contrast, learning things about how the, how the how the business has to work, for example, who the customer set is at a, at a fairly abstract level, or, or how you have to enter it was a much more valuable lesson. And so what we saw in that study that in fact that the entrepreneurs who were able to take, not just, with the, not just get experience, but in fact codify that experience into a small number of simple rules, which then provided the, the platform, provided the scaffolding for, for scaling, that they were the ones who were more successful. Hey. I'll say one, one other thing. This is probably sounding somewhat like Lean Startup, so I thought I might just say a couple things about Lean Startup. Well, the story I've been trying to say on the, on the, the doing is that, is that better entrepreneurs are experimenting more, they are more, they have, not just experimenting more, they have a broader repertoire of ways in which they can experiment. For example, there are times when you do parallel, there are times to do sequential, there are times to do passive. So they have a broader repertoire, they have a broader repertoire of ways to solve problems, and, um, and they also, when they, when they are learning and, and experimenting and so forth, they're codifying into simple rules. What's different from Lean Startup? I think what's different, actually I wouldn't say it's different. What I would say is that Lean Startup is a methodology um, that came out of a particular kind of startup, which was largely around software. And, and actually Steve Blanks, who was one of my colleagues, as, as some of you may know, so I know Steve pretty well, and I think he's a really insightful guy. But I think that those of us who are academics, I think, think a little bit more abstractly. And so there's this idea, for example, lean startup of, of hypothesis test, hypothesis test, hypothesis test. Well, that's, it, it's pretty much lean startup is about doing, and there actually is a thinking aspect to forming startups. Again, around understanding the economic game, shaping the playing field, seeing who the different players are. So there's more to, I think, startups than simply Hypothesis testing, hypothesis testing. There's a thinking aspect to it. The second thing I think that's different, I think that probably many of you would agree, is, is, that, is that having a startup is more than customer discovery. It's more than, it's more than talking, about 100 talking to 100 customers. It's more fundamentally about resolving bottlenecks. And in fact, as I've been looking over the past couple of years and sort of thinking about my older studies as well, what we're starting to realize is that scale up is fundamentally about recognizing bottlenecks and resolving those. 
And it just so happens that in software, the bottleneck is very often customer discovery. But in other settings, it's not customer discovery. For example, in two-sided marketplaces, it's typically better to actually focus on the supply first as the first bottleneck. In technical businesses like DJI and the drones, it's often technical problems that come up first. And so customer discovery fits software, but more fundamentally, it, it's, it's about resolving the bottleneck that is keeping you from growing. And often you're either doing that with a one-off move or you're doing it with simple rules. So to give you an example, um, many of you probably know the, um, the story of Apple and the MP3 player and how that was probably Apple's most profitable product ever. Um, and one of the things that, that, that Apple did, or just, and Steve Jobs and his, and his colleagues did, was recognize what were the bottlenecks to the, the, to the widespread adoption of the MP3 player. And there were really two. One of them was uh, around the, uh, the relationships with, with the record companies, which was probably the primary bottleneck. And then after that, there was a bottleneck around flash memory. And so what, what the entrepreneurs, or they weren't entrepreneurs so much anymore then, but at Apple did, was first of all solve the problem of, of the record companies around iTunes and so on. They also secondarily solved the bottleneck around flash memory by long-term contracts with, um, with the memory suppliers. So sometimes you can resolve a bottleneck by a one-off move like a contract with a flash memory supplier, but often you're, you're, solving, you're resolving the bottleneck with, with some simple rules. For example, in the case of Airbnb that I started out with, simple rules around how do you select hosts and manage hosts. Uh, simple rules about how, which, which, which cities to go to. And I think one of the basic ideas around, around scaling up is this idea of seeing entrepreneurship as resolving a series, first of all, identifying and then resolving bottlenecks, uh, either with simple rules that, uh, on a process that scales or on simply a one-off move like, like the uh, flash memory. But this idea of building a scaffolding and then you can scale. The final thing I think is different from Lean Startup is that there's a sort of idea as we're sort of rapidly prototyping. But it doesn't actually tell you about that there are actually multiple ways you can experiment and that some kinds of experimentation are not about just doing, 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 but they're in fact stopping and reflecting. And it's also nothing about the different repertoires of the ways in which people problem solve. And there are different ways to problem solve. And so, so I think, so the, I guess the takeaway I'm trying to say here about Lean Startup is not that it's wrong, because I think it's, I think it's right, I think it's clever, and I wish I'd been as clever as Steve and, and um, Eric Ries to package it and have the impact that they've had. But from an intellectual standpoint, it's, 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 too, it's too software. And if you come up a level in the abstraction, I think there's more going on. So it's more than hypothesis testing, more than dis customer discovery, more than, more, than, more than just MVPs. It's about thinking and doing. It's about resolving bottlenecks, whatever they are. And it's about experimentation and problem solving and having a repertoire. So fine, I think that something just maybe I think I'm hitting the end here. So I think just to, to wrap it up, um, it is kind of disconcerting because I actually can't see you at all. So I hope, I hope it's going okay out there. I hope you're still there. Um, <laughs> all I can see is the front row. I can't see if everyone else has gone out for drinks or anything. Um, but anyway, let me just say what's, what's the wrap up here. Because I also feel like I haven't been too entertaining either, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll work on my entertaining. In any event, what's the story here? The story here is that in entrepreneurial settings, the name of the game is growth. It's not profit, it's not other things, it's about growth. And keep that in mind. And that in that kind of a setting where the name of the game is growth, and, and you're really relying on a strategy that's, that's combining both thinking and doing. And it's relying on a logic that's about opportunity capture. And finally, I want to, I didn't really, maybe my slides may not be conveying it as well I'm trying to convey, but how important the idea and the concept of bottlenecks is. Uh, and the idea that bottlenecks are both something that you have to spot and they're something that you have to resolve. And that the entrepreneurs who are able to spot and resolve are the ones that are the, are the ones that typically are able to, to, um, to scale their firms. So that's, I don't know, I'm just going to end on the final point because I love that picture. But I think this is a really, hopefully the idea is that the best entrepreneurs figure out the simplicity of what they're doing and, and scale it up. So thanks a lot, um, and I think I can. I think we can do some Q and A, or we can do something else. But uh, let's see what happens. Anyway, thanks a lot, everybody.
Okay, any, any, uh, I, let's see, I can't see you out there. Any questions or any comments anybody has? I think, I think the issue, the, the question was around, do, I, do we think about entrepreneurs being successful on dimensions other than financial? I think was the, the, the drift of the question. Um, I think the, certainly I think the logic around bottlenecks is, is valid. We're looking right now at online education and in that, you know, like the, um, the MOOC space. So companies like edX, Coursera, Udacity. And some of those companies are, are focused on, on growth and profitability. But some of these, actually not even, some of them are not even companies, they're organizations. Others of them are interested in, in spreading learning around the world. Uh, I think for, for all of, for the, regardless of the mission of those companies, the more successful ones are ones that are look, thinking in terms of bottlenecks, that are experimenting. Um, I'm trying to think what would be different. Um, I think the, the attention maybe to rivalry is maybe not so interesting. But I think the idea of you know, paying attention to substitutes, you know, for example, if you're trying to, to innovate in something like education, you may want to be different from, you might want to compare yourself to traditional universities and see on what dimensions you want to be different. Uh, you might want to understand uh, what, what game you're playing. So I, I, I'm not quite sure how much of it generalizes, but I think the, certainly the idea of bottlenecks, I think, generalizes. What's the bottleneck to, for example, advancing education? What's the bottleneck to, uh, to, to having an environmental mission? I think that, that part, I think that part translates fairly well. Oh, that was great teamwork. Thank you. So uh, my name is Michael Ehrlich. I'm from uh, the New Jersey Institute of Technology. So the question I had for you is um, about sort of valuation for some of these companies and sort of the strategic or real options aspects of uh, thinking about which, which way you're going to go and, and how you, because you didn't really sort of address um, uh, the, the, what I think was the real options in terms of looking at strategic alternatives as um, either complements or uh, or adjacent areas, or you know, kind of the expansion strategies for these for these uh, early stage companies. Are you thinking about it from the point of view of, of acquisition versus staying independent? Is that what you mean, or or, or do you mean? Uh, so more, I'm thinking in terms of in terms of as you as you scale up. Uh, are you looking to sort of expand your core area or looking to uh, go into adjacent areas? Uh, you know, kind of how do you how do you sort of follow that path of sort of scaling up and um, it, as, as a strategic matter? Yeah, I guess I guess I, I think about it as as thinking about companies as which is not particularly what I was talking about now, but uh, but when they get when they sort of have a strategy and they're actually have scaled to some extent, I, I tend to think about companies as having what I think of as, as a gene sequence. So you're in a particular, you have a particular product, you're in a particular geographic area, you have a particular distribution channel, and you know, whatever other, you know, particular technology. And you maybe have five or six sort of core genes, if you will. I think the more successful firms will, will mutate on, well, first of all, they'll scale on one of, the, one of those genes. For example, they internationalize. Or they will um, develop product after product after product. When you're scaling on a single facet like that, you're kind of in the, in the world of simple rules where, you, where you're scaling on a particular strategy. Uh, when you're trying to scale on multiple genes, then you're, then you're really sort of doing something bigger. I think the classic example is, is Amazon. If Amazon if it starts out as, you know, books, books, and it's, you know, a particular distribution channel, and it's to customers, and it's North American. And then they, you know, add movies and video, and there's they have actually have a, a there's actually a formula that they're using to add, add categories. But then over time they go to they, they they then change in a different way, which is 
they, they flip multiple genes at once and they actually start selling, not their product, but they start selling their back end system. And they start, and they change the channel from being online to a corporate and enterprise sales force. They change the customer for being you and me to being uh, retailers like, like Toys R Us or L.L. Bean or whatever retailer it might be. And so, and so I think the point I'm trying to make is, is I think p firms grow successfully after the startup. The startup phase is a little bit different, but once you're in, in, a, in an established firm, you're, you're growing by typically mutating on one gene, but every so often, if you're really a very clever company, you're mutating on several and you're really redoing your business model. And, and I think um, Amazon is particularly the good example of that, where they, where they, and then if you look at the AWS, it's again selling a different part of their business to a different customer through a different channel. So I don't know if that's went too far from where you wanted to go, but, but that's, uh, that's at least how I think about it. And I think most entrepreneurs that I know um, and their investors are expecting growth. And in order to grow, you've got to, be, you've got to be scaling on something and then typically changing up what you're scaling on. So for example, Uber scales first, you know, scales first of all in a single city, and then they're clearly scaling on, on geography. Yep, or I guess I'm not in charge. Thank you, Kathy. Ted Ladd from Halt and Harvard. Um, the question, I'm intrigued by the notion of pausing. Yeah. Do you have any consistently reliable weak signals to tell companies when they should pause? And does pausing work for some types of companies but not others? I think pausing is something that we're just sort of thinking about. But it came from the idea that in, you know, in, in a lot of thinking about entrepreneurs, it's always go, 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 go. And then we've seen a couple of examples now where pausing was to your advantage. And it seems to be advantageous when, when you're facing a high degree of not only uncertainty, but ambiguity about what, what to do. And so you don't really have something for sure that you know. You just know, well, maybe there's something out there we don't know. Let's pause and see if it shows up. So I think it's, if, it's, if it's straight up uncertainty, you can experiment on it. But if it's ambiguity, you sort of have to wait and see how the world unfolds. Um, and so I, I, I know that's not a super satisfactory answer, but this idea of pausing, I think, is a pretty interesting one. And it does seem to be related to when there's a high degree of ambiguity and you just sort of want to be sure. And what you typically are, what we've seen the you know, entrepreneurs doing is they'll, they'll be waiting and they'll be watching to see what's changing both for themselves and for what else is happening in their industry. And then, because pausing actually, as it turns out, doesn't really cost you anything. You know, doing something you have to, you know, pay people to do and so on. Pausing you can just do for free. Um, and so you can pause and then sort of watch and then move when, when you have to. So that's, I think that's, so that's, uh, that's again, I think a new thing we've been thinking about, but I think it's, it is around ambiguity. Uh, Neil Brewer from the University of Haifa. Uh, I was wondering whether you can tie uh, dynamic capabilities into the context of growth and perhaps uh, replace it with uh, some of the obstacles or the bottlenecks that you were talking about. So tie into dynamic capabilities? Re replace the explanation of bottlenecks with dynamic capabilities, if that, if that is even possible. Uh, I think it's... Bottlenecks are not, not a capability. There's something in your way. So, for example, if I, if I use the, the, drone, the drone company, DJI, um, one, of the first, one of the first bottlenecks they face is what's the killer app? We have, we have this drone who wants one and why will they buy it? If you, because they wanted to extend beyond. The, I mean, the original market was a hobbyist market where it was a bunch of people, typically 20 to 40 year old men, putting together, you know, having soldering irons and putting together kits and flying drones with their friends. And, but, but DJI wanted to move beyond that to a more, you know, a broader, a broader market. And, and, and so they, they engaged, and so the, the, the initial bottleneck was what's the killer app? What are we going to actually use this for? And as they began exploring that, which is a pretty interesting way they explored it, which was around parallel experimentation of different verticals. But when they figured out, ultimately what they figured out was the killer app, at least to start, was, was movies, was Hollywood movies. Um, 
And then as they thought more deeply about it, what is it the, the problem was then the fact that they didn't have what's known as a gimbal, which is what stabilizes a drone that, that makes the video quality video. And so then you had to figure, okay, how do we do a drone? How do we do a, vi a gimbal? And then later on, the next bottleneck is around what's known as a ready-to-fly drone. But there's a series of bottlenecks that aren't a capability. They're, they're, a, they're a bottleneck in the industry. Um, and, and in fact, that's probably an old-time economics concept from someone like, um, like Rosenberg, the idea of a bottleneck like that. Uh, the dynamic capabilities part comes in, and there are really two ways to think about dynamic capabilities. One is that it's some processes like sales and so on. The other way is to think about dynamic capabilities being, for example, experimentation as a dynamic capability, or um, problem solving as a dynamic capability. So those dynamic capabilities are the, are the processes that one might use to resolve the bottleneck or see the bottleneck, but they aren't the bottleneck. The bottleneck is something else in which you, you would apply, let's say, a dynamic capability like experimentation against so you could figure out how to solve the bottleneck. Is that, does that make sense? Well, I, th I think that's inherent. I think that's what dynamic capabilities do, in in the context of growth, anyway. Is they a dynamic capability is focusing on how do you figure at least, as I think about them, is, is focusing on how do you overcome a bottleneck. I don't know that I don't know it's been written that way, but I think that's ultimately what they're about. Because otherwise, what are you doing? What are you doing with a dynamic capability? You, you have to be doing something with it, and I think it's around, around resolving bottlenecks. Whether that bottleneck is around the killer app, whether that bottleneck is around product architecture, whether it's business model, um, it, it tends to have some sort of a bottleneck you have to overcome. Is that it? Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the conference.